Oyo akwa nangu oyo Kunya da poenda Who the jacket fits Let them wear it Who the jacket fits, let them wear it.
to get started. Um, um, first, please, a round of applause for Matthew Tembo. Um, Matthew Tembo has been a musical star in Zambia for more than a decade. Um, he's currently a doctoral student in ethnomusicology at the University of Pittsburgh and director of Pitt's Afro Ensemble. Thank you, um, Matthew Tembo, for entertaining us um, with this music of welcome. And we'll get to hear from Matthew again at the end. So um, thank you all for coming today. My name is Jenny Burnett. I'm a professor of anthropology here at Georgia State University and director of the Institute for Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. We're so excited to welcome so many guests from Zambia, the Zambian diaspora, and um, the community of Metro Atlanta to Georgia State University for this event. Um, to get us started and give us a few words of welcome, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Carrie Manning, Associate Provost for International Initiatives at Georgia State. Professor Manning is the author of three books and more than two dozen journal articles and contributions to edited volumes. Her research on comparative democratization and post-conflict societies has been featured, has featured cases from across the African continent. Dr. Manning has conducted seminars in civil military relations in more than a dozen African countries. She lived in Southern Africa from 1994 to 1998 and served as country director for the National Democratic Institute in Angola in 1997 and 1998. Provost Manning. Thank you, Jenny. On behalf of the Office of International Initiatives and Georgia State University, it's my great privilege to welcome you here tonight. Um, I'm really pleased to be here as, because of you, as you heard from Jenny, um, I've had a very long-standing interest in Africa and African politics as a teacher and a scholar. So I'm thrilled that we'll be here tonight discussing African women decolonizing history culture, and the arts through digital humanities. I'd like to recognize our distinguished guests, some of whom have traveled quite a distance to be here, while others are closer to home. 
His Excellency, the Honorable Chibamba Kanyama, Ambassador of Zambia to the United States of America. Welcome. <clears throat> President Mono of SUNY Schenectady. <clears throat> President Mishek Mwaba. <clears throat> and of course, Ms. Mulenga Kapwepwe, Zambian playwright, <clears throat> about whom you'll hear much more in a minute. I'd also like to thank um, the event co-organizer, Zambians Promoting Leadership in America. I'm excited to learn more about this organization as well tonight. Um, and I'd also like to recognize the GSU students um, in the audience and alumni uh, of GSU from Zambia in attendance today, as well as youth from the diaspora who are here in the audience this evening. Welcome. <laughs> So it's my honor to represent GSU tonight as the Interim Associate Provost for International Initiatives, and I just want to say a few words about Georgia State while I have the opportunity. Many of you may know Georgia State is a national model for student success. Um, we are the number one ranked public university for undergraduate teaching in the United States. Um, we're ranked number three for innovative universities, and we are the third fastest growing research university in the United States. I think what's even more important than those achievements is what we have done for student success. Since 2003, the university has increased our six, or decreased our six-year graduation rate by 23 points, percentage points. And that saves students on average about $18 million in tuition each year. We graduate more than 10,000 career-ready students every year. We have a new strategic plan that focuses um, not only on student success, on building on these successes that we already have, but also on promoting career readiness uh, for our students. We have one of the most diverse student bodies of any college or university in the country, and we've eliminated achievement gaps based on race, ethnicity, or income. And as you see, we're, we're located in the heart of a metropolitan area that's a hub of technology, transportation, and international business, and that, of course, has been at the heart of movements for civil rights and social justice. We are globally engaged. Um, the Office of International Initiatives has recently been recognized, I would say in the past 18 months, we've received two prestigious national awards recognizing our um, campus's comprehensive globalization. Um, so we're very proud of that. We had 750 students study abroad this year, and we have uh, around 70 programs that allow students to study uh, abroad with faculty or on exchange programs. So we take pride in our international footprint, we, which includes welcoming international students from all over the world. Um, we're really glad you all are here tonight, and thank you to um, the Institute for Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and the co-sponsors for making this event possible. Thanks very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Chitavala Kabulo. I am a Bemba Zambian, um, an alumni of Georgia State University, and part of ZLA, which is putting on the um, mind Shifting Mindsets for Entrepreneur Success Diaspora Conference. So I'm very excited to be here under all those umbrellas, and I want to share a little bit how uh, those three identities have added value to my life. Uh, being Zambian and a Bemba woman has given me a sense of culture and deep roots and mentors like Vamlenga Kapopwe, for which multiple generations of Zambians uh, on her shoulders we stand. And I say her shoulders must be heavy because it's so many people from, you know, people from her decade to um, teenagers now who tap into her resources and wealth of knowledge that she holds uh, as a Zambian cultural icon. She's our very godmother, you know. She, she, she holds so much knowledge and when she speaks, you understand why. But only that, she also is doing a lot um, in the digital space and uh, working on the future of uh, e the economy. Uh, in, and that's hat she doesn't talk about so much, but I've spent the last two days with her and I'm very inspired and very excited about what she's doing. Um, and then Georgia State, 
Um, I entered this university as a very young, uh, <laughs> bashful young lady. Um, and by the time I left Georgia State University as a leader on campus, I had uh, my pick of employer and a really clear understanding of what I wanted to do, to do for my career. And it was a really safe launching point and a key to my success in the past 10 years in corporate America. So very grateful to this university. Thank you for having us and thank you for celebrating my culture. And ZLA has also been uh, a great resource as a young woman as I am working through my identity and trying to reconnect and strengthen my roots. It's been an avenue to reconnect to professionals who are speaking the same language I'm speaking, have the same interests, culture, arts, and also, um, I've connected with people who have my experience, right? They've been in the professional environment. I was having a chat about what that does to you out there. And uh, fun fact, I reconnected for the last year. And I'm very excited about this conference because it gives me the opportunity to explore what the next thing looks like. As a diasporan, I'm really excited about engaging here in Atlanta, but also in Zambia. And I'm very happy to meet you. So. Welcome to Georgia State. Welcome to Atlanta, Mwaiseni. I hope you enjoyed this conversation, and um, I hope you share my excitement and um, you grow from the experience that we've planned. We worked really hard, and we've been very thoughtful about the programming that we have. So, you know, take advantage. You know, rub shoulders with the greats in this room. There are so many, and there's so many more that are on their way that you meet. I've been laughing about how I'm, I'm hoping greatness, you know, transfers through osmosis. See, I'm sitting next to Bamulenga. Find somebody great to sit next to. The conversations are different, and you leave enlightened and better off. So encouraging you to mingle and, and, and again, take the opportunity that we presented. All right, so now I want to introduce our first address. We have um, a, a man who spent most of his career in the private sector. And as diasporans, we're very excited to have him represent us um, as um, our former representative to this country, and he's been very generous with his time. He has listened to some of our problems and is facilitating the conversations between government and the private sector. We're very eager to invest, and we want to you know, sometimes save, but also collaborate with Zambians. And it's challenging because our worlds are so different and we spent a lot of time away from there. So as somebody who understands two worlds, we're very excited to have you be our representatives. So join me in welcoming Ambassador Chivamba Kanyama. All right, good evening. Um, happy to see many faces in this audience. I, of course, acknowledge the professor and a few other people who have been to Zambia before. Uh, anybody been to Zambia? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm tired of telling people that Zambia is north of South Africa because many <laughs> appear to know South Africa. I just want to appreciate uh, the presentation you're going to listen to today, um, the lady who is going to be speaking to us, um, Ms. Mulenga Kapwepe, somebody I've known for many, many years. But we got much closer at the time I was Director General of the Zambia National Broadcasting Corporation, uh, which is television and radio. And she came up with a highly creative television piece um, called Back to the Future? Well, uh, past to Present. <laughs> past to Present. Uh, because I've been looking for it on YouTube to see <laughs> if it is still there. Um, it, has, it, it was a, a creative piece of connecting the Zambia's past culture to the present, to connect the old generation and the new young generation using music. What she did was she spent a lot of time in the archives, our broadcasting archives, um, digging out music that was performed in Zambia from the 1950s. 
this was indigenous music, the music that you are listening to just now. And she went in all these Zambian cultures. We have got various Zambian cultures or tribes. And she went across all of those and listened to that music using uh, latest technology, harvested. Some of it was scratched, but she still got good sound out of it. And then she went out into the market and got the best young musicians, young performers, and say, and put them in a room, listen to this music of before even your parents were born. This is music performed by your great-grandparents many years ago. Listen to it. And she asked them a question, can you perform this music using modern voices, modern instruments, and make it danceable? And they did that. So she would start the program with a cultural history to this music, what was the underlying truth to this music, how did the people lead? Because when they came up with a piece of music, something was happening in the cultures about food, about dance, about entertainment, what was going on those years. And they relieve that moment today. Perform that moment, make sure that we connect to the past. Let's connect the past to the present. How do we do that? So they would start by playing that music of many years ago, and then suddenly, with, I don't know how they did it, they would, the, the instrumentalists, the recordists, and musicians would convert that music to modern kind of rap. <laughs> of course, not rap as such, but it was kind of like danceable, modern music, which would appeal to the young generation. There's some odd music appealing to the modern generation. And this is, it ended up being highly rated on television because the scholars and entertainment people are also that actually we are not disconnected to our culture. Whatever happens today is a, it has got some, something to, with our culture in the past. We cannot disconnect from it. And based on what you have just said here, Chita, and that's my last remark, as ambassador to the USA, I told the president of Zambia the time he was swearing me in and we took pictures outside. And apparently, I said this to President Biden the time I was passing on my credentials. So I just said, look, there's something that Zambia can offer. Your Excellency, Mr. President. One is culture. What can we share to the Americans about our culture? And what can Americans share to Zambia about our culture? Because it is through culture we drive entrepreneurship, we drive business. That's how it moves. We cannot disconnect from it completely. And as ambassador, it's a question of how do we therefore monetize culture? How do we make it valuable and appreciated and create livelihoods out of it? So today you're going to listen to a great woman with whom we all admire and respect in Zambia. She doesn't just talk about it, she lives it. She lives about what she believes in. And we admire her so much. And I'm sure that you enjoy her presentation and the discussion they're going to have today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Chibamba Kanyama, for your kind words of introduction and showing us, um, uh, letting us know something else that Bamulenga Kapwepwe has done in her great career. Um, so before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to give a special welcome to Carla Kabwatha, teacher at Freedom Middle School in Stone Mountain. She is the coach of the school's Freebots Free Bot Robotics team and uh, she brought 15 students and team members with her this evening. So let's welcome the Freebots team. We're thrilled to have you at Georgia State and we hope today will convince you that you should consider applying here when it's time to go to university. Um, so it is great to see young people here learning about the world of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, we hope you will also learn some new ideas from Ba Mulenga this evening that you can take with you to your next competition. Uh, I'd like to thank and welcome uh, co-sponsors of the, the, this event and the other ZLA, ZLA events this week, the ABSA Bank Executives and also Cesar Swale. Um, and I'd like to give special recognition to Frida Mwamba 
Brazel, co-founder of Zambians for Leadership in America. Thank you, Frida, for your collaboration on this event. I'm so happy that we're able to bring so many Zambians and friends of Zambia to the Georgia State campus to hear this amazing lecture tonight. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, Bamulenga Mhundu Kapwepwe. I first met uh, Bamulenga in Zambia in 2016, and it was thanks to Frida who made the introduction. Um, Bamulenga met with me during my first days of a research trip where I was investigating a new project. In my 90 minutes with her, I was transfixed and transformed. She's such um, an amazing person to speak with. Um, I learned so much during those 90 minutes about Zambia, its history and its culture, and especially about leveraging humanities and the arts to build better societies, which is what uh, Bamulenga has done through her entire career. I'm absolutely thrilled to be welcoming her, that, that she responded positively to our invitation to speak here tonight, and that she'll be um, sharing her ideas with you. For those of you who are unaware, Ba Mulenga is an award-winning playwright and author of numerous books and plays. She received her bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Zambia. She's been at the helm of the creative industries in Zambia for more than two decades, following a varied career working in hospitality, government, education, health, tourism, mining, business, child rights, and non-governmental sectors. To the students and young people in the room, I encourage you to learn from her example that having a career doesn't mean doing one thing for your entire life, but you can move and change um, and uh, in reinvent yourself over and over again. Bamulenga is a co-founder of the Lubutu Libraries, an organization that has built children's libraries in underserved communities across Zambia. And 10 years ago, she founded a film school for underprivileged youth. In 2016, she co-founded the Women's History Museum, which works to document and disseminate women's history. The mission of the museum is to research, interpret, restore, document, and disseminate African indigenous knowledge and living histories focused on women. The Women's History Museum has been recognized on several platforms as change maker in Africa and um, as well as globally. In 2020, the British Broadcasting Cooperation, or the BBC, recognized Bamulenga Kapwepwe as one of the top most 100 influential women in the world. Um, this introduction, by the way, has barely scratched the surface of all of the amazing things that she's done um, in her lifetime. Um, but without further ado, um, I welcome Bamulenga Kapwepwe to the stage. piece of paper here because I'm um, at that age <laughs> when thoughts just you know kind of slide past. Um, let me start by thanking Georgia State University for hosting this event. Um, it's an honor uh, to be here. Uh, let me thank um, ZLA for organizing oh, everything and getting me here, kicking and screaming, getting me here. <laughs> um, let me also thank the ambas our ambassador for making the time to actually come all this way um, to be with us. Um, that's absolutely um, something that you're meant to do, but I'm happy that you are here. And as he said, we've known each other for a very long time, so it was very nice to see him here as well. Um, I can't remember everybody, <laughs> so I'll write on the protocols that I think Jenny called out everybody who's important here, so um, I'll write on her protocols. Let me start um, by trying to explain how um, African women 
at least the African women who belong to the um, Women's History Museum of Zambia. And so there's the Women's History of Zambia, Women's History of Zambia is made of 10 women, basically. It's a, it's a cooperative. And um, we have two objectives, which is uh, one is to um, excavate the narratives and the histories of women, um, Zambian women, but also African women in general. Because um, if you ask any of the Zambians who my father was, they will tell you who my father was, because everybody knows who my father was. But if you ask them who my mother was, they won't be able to tell you who she was. But she contributed just as much as my father to the liberation struggle. So for me, that was a, a particular pain point that I needed to address. And so my father always said, if you see a problem and you need it resolved, if not you, then who? So I decided to resolve <laughs> that problem. And my friend and I were having coffee one day and uh, we decided to form the Women's History Museum so that the names of the women in our history could become visible and audible again. And that's how that started. Um, so the mission of that um, museum was mostly to lift up the profiles of women through our history. But another pain point for me has always been the fact that a lot of our, of our history, the documentation and so forth, has been done from the eyes, through the eyes of other people and not our own. And so our stories are always told by other people and not us. And that was another thing that I felt we needed to address. So our museum basically aims at those things. I'll concentrate mostly on the museum, although I could tell you a little bit about the, um, <laughs> the musical television program that I produced, because <laughs> that was a lot of fun. But um, I'll just run through what we've been doing and what we have done to do this. So the first thing that we did as the Women's History Museum, you know, as we were kind of just getting organized, one is we decided we'd make it, um, we'd start by making it a digital museum. So it's a dig digital museum. Um, the first thing that happened actually before we even kind of um, got, got everything together was we were approached by the Sami people from Sweden. The Sami, the Sami people are, the, are kind of like the, the native people of Sweden and Finland, you know, up there where you have like Icelandic people. Yeah, so the Sami people are natives of Sweden, but they approached us because they said, the Swedish people don't understand our experience as Sami people. And we feel that you will be able to help us because you've had the colonial experience and we feel colonized. But if we ask the Swedish people to, to curate our museum, which they were just building, they said, we don't think they'll tell our story because they really don't understand how oppressed we have felt all along. So that was our first project. And we worked with the Sami people in Sweden and helped them to, to bring out their story and how they have felt living in Sweden as Swedes, but in a very, very different um, space. One, while we were in Sweden and we were doing all this work, we also met um, the officials from the Swedish Ethnographic Museum. And that is something I'll tell you about as well, what, the work that we're doing with them. But we thought about how do we get, um, how do we get the, 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 the histories of our women out there, um, somewhere where people can actually go and read about them. So the first thing we did was to partner with uh, Wikipedia. And what we did was we trained 34 young people, journalists, bloggers, writers. We trained those people how to research, reference, and write for Wikipedia. It's a very kind of rigid um, 
structure that you have to follow when you're writing for Wikipedia. So we felt if we can get at least 34 young Zambians to write about our history, our women, um, that will make, maybe we will address something. What we discovered when we spoke to Wikipedia is that um, five stories, when five stories are submitted to Wikipedia about personalities, only one out of those five will be about a woman. And when you come to Africa, it's even less. So we decided we were going to tackle that problem. And we started by training those 34 young people to write research and do all that for Wikipedia. And then we went out on television, radio, everywhere, and asked the public, the whole country, like which women do you want to learn about? And we got a huge response. Um, so what we did is we, we um, selected the 100 most frequently asked for women, and we gave them to those 34. And the 34 started digging up those, um, the histories of those women, researching them and finding the references and so forth. That story, I think, resulted in um, adding, I think, quite a bit. If you look at Wikipedia now, I think Zambia's got the most histories of women. And And what we do is we also, we do, we do what we call a wikithon every year, and we get more women researched and more women, we try to put more women on, the, on, on Wikipedia. What we did discover as we were doing this is that um, Wikipedia is very um, Eurocentric. <laughs> so if, I, if, I, if we researched a, a woman for whom perhaps there's only either oral, you know, because the woman is still alive and so forth, and you interview her and get her history and everything, Wikipedia would reject your submission because they say, well, you know, there's no reference from some Western scholar or something, so we can't accept this. So a lot of our stories, some of them are in what you call the sandbox in, in, in Wikipedia terms. And that made us start thinking, so then how are we ever going to get our stories onto Wikipedia if we we're only allowed to put them there if somebody from the West approves them to be there. So we started thinking about that and um, one of the things that we're in the process of, of, of creating because we realized, one, we have to invent our own, our own model of referencing as Africans because this is an African problem all the other African countries also are facing the same thing. Whether it's oral history, whether it's written history, we're going to have to start finding a way of referencing our history. Um, the, the next thing that we have done is that we are now creating a women's publishing collective because we realize that unless we publish as Africans and African women and African writers, we're not going to have the references that we need to get onto those kind of platforms. So as the Women's History Museum, one of the things that we're doing is actually creating a publishing collective for women. Um, the other idea that we had um, was to, how do we get this history out uh, as accessible as possible about these women? How do we get it out so that everybody can actually listen to it or watch it or whatever? Because we felt if we hide it in some publication somewhere, people are not really going to connect. So we started making three minute, three minute um, animations called Leading Ladies. And um, at this point, we've made 42, starting from about the 1600s. Um, from every province of Zambia. We have documented, we've made the history, we created a format, and um, they became very popular. Um, so popular that actually we were asked to do another series for Zimbabwe and Malawi.
Um, what was interesting about that as well was that the, the students at, at the tertiaries, the University of Zambia and the colleges, took those stories and they'd have you know, these fireside chats about them. It was so interesting also to find that um, some fashion designers had actually started uh, creating fashion lines with the names of the women from our history. <laughs> um, we also, because um, we kind of put it out there like, do what you want with the history, because we just want it to be accessible as possible to people. One of the things that also happened is that we have a um, spoken word, a spoken word group of young people, and they started holding these events, spoken word events, uh, creating spoken word from the history that was on the podcast, and those were always sold out. It was just amazing um, how much animation came out of those um, spoken word events, but each spoken word just basically tackled maybe four of the podcasts. And so it was a very interesting way of getting people to start discussing our history, uh, discussing our past and the women that they didn't know about. Um, the Ministry of Education uh, in my country then also approached us and said, can you write these stories for, for 10 year olds? Because they wanted 10 year olds to start learning their history. So we're in the process of that. Um, one of the things about those three minute animations, um, as I said, we've kind of spanned from the 1600s to the current time. One of the things that we did as well was to partner with uh, a restaurant. We partnered with a restaurant and one whole side of the restaurant, we converted those three minute podcasts into QR codes. So when you're in the restaurant and you're waiting for your menu, you can actually just get into the history. <laughs> Um, our motto is that you can get into our, into our museum from any point, even from a mug, t-shirt. <laughs> you can dive into our history from any point. So we have created those QR codes onto t-shirts, onto mugs, so that you know, people can actually just learn about a woman just by pointing their phone at the wall or at a t-shirt or at a mug. And what has happened also is that in that restaurant now, they have pretty happy because people actually go there to take pictures by the QR codes because some of those QR codes are actually about somebody's grandmother or somebody's sister. So it's become one of those um, selfie spots <laughs> in the restaurant, <laughs> which is pretty good. But I think the other thing that we wanted to bring out in those podcasts, in those, in those animations, was one of the things that we like to um, tackle in the museum is, is to bring out the concepts the way we understand them as Africans, because a lot of the times, whether it's gender, whether it's whatever, has really got a, a tint of how other cultures understand that, that concept. Um, so we have, um, for example, leadership. What was female leadership like? What is female leadership? Well, how do we share power in our own traditional settings? How did we share power? Um, how, what role did women play in peacekeeping? What peace treaties are there that we could go back to? And some of the peace treaties that we, the women we talked about who had created peace and, and, and peace treaties go back maybe two or 300 years. And those peace, peace treaties are still alive and they're still kept in the society. So we wanted to explore even concepts of peacekeeping. How did women actually um, articulate and make sure that they created this peace? But we also wanted to explore what was climate justice, for example. What, what is climate justice in our traditional understanding of it? And one of the series that we did was actually about uh, traditional ecofeminists. And we explored the positions that women hold, uh, certain women hold in our, in our culture even today. Women who, through hereditary, are in charge of groves, groves, which are gene pools for the entire forest. Uh, we explored the, the, the Sesheke woman, um, the bee woman of Sesheke. Her role is to keep bee health, because without bees, we all disappear. Um, we explored the position of one woman in, in, in Sesheke, further down on the Kwango River, whose role 
is to keep the health of the river. So we explored, we also explore those kind of things that um, Westerners wouldn't really look at because they don't see them as even part of climate justice, but they are. And so we put that out as well so people can understand how we also see the world and how we've managed certain things um, in terms of climate or in terms of just the environment itself and the safety of animals and all living things. So we did um, a whole series on, on the traditional eco-feminists eco and those, some of them are, are living. Um, you know, what is power? Who holds power? Who held power? How did we share power? Um, we, we did a series on, on that uh, because some of our chiefdoms um, co-share power. Um, the, the chiefdom of Mukuni, for example, is a chiefdom where the chief, the two, the two big chiefs, is always a man and a woman. All the headmen, all the villages, the headmen, headwoman, headman, because the power, it was part, part of a power, it was part of a conflict resolution a strategy. Because when those men invaded that particular area of Zambia, the women negotiated for peace, but they held back some of the power. Chief Mukuni, who's the male side of that chiefdom, when he leaves Livingston, which is where, where that kingdom is, when he leaves Livingston, he has to hand his power to, to Bediango, the female chief. When she leaves Livingston, she doesn't have to give him her power. <laughs> if he rule, if, and this is the interesting thing because the, um, once a year, during the, the rainmaking ceremony, and, and that's another thing that we did. We did all the, the rainmaking queens, some of them still alive. Some of the, the rainmaking ceremonies are still happening. But what happens um, after the rainmaking ceremony under those two is that all the women, all the women who are past childbearing, take the chief, the male chief, and they can tell him, they go through how he has ruled in the past year, and if he hasn't done well, they have the license to actually censure him. They can even insult him if they want. He is not allowed to react. If they feel that he is a hopeless case, <laughs> nothing can be done with this man, they will take him to Bediango, the female chief, and basically he has to decide which way he wants to die. Yeah. He has to be removed from the throne. She can remove him from the throne. He cannot remove her from her throne. And so we were, we were exploring this kind of dynamics. Um, Nachituti in Wapula and how she negotiated when the invaders came into her land. How did she negotiate? She, she basically said, you can, you can have the political power but we will have the power over all the natural resources. And up to today, even when you go for the traditional ceremony, the first thing that happens is the current Nachituti brings uh, a basket of soil and a pot of water to signify that that treaty still holds. So we explored those kind of things, um, those kind of um, power sharing dynamics, who could be what, who held what position. Um, a lot of the chieftaincies or might have a, a male ruler, but it's the women who choose who goes to the throne. So there's all sorts of different dynamics like that that we were happy to explore and put out there. And we did that through all those uh, podcasts. Um, I, I spoke a little bit about the, the Swedish museum, the Swedish ethnographic museum. We, we went to visit the museum and we discovered that that museum actually had 800 objects that had been taken from Zambia. When they interviewed me on Swedish radio, I think I kind of traumatized the whole country because I kept because <laughs> I kept saying stolen, <laughs> and they kept saying no. But um, some of those were missionaries. I said, "Yeah, missionaries stole." <laughs> so, <laughs> so we found these eight hundred objects, um, and. Um, 
the, the, the discussion right now is very much around bringing those objects back to Africa. But there's so much red tape, there's so much politics, there's so much complication about which object the European museums don't want to let them go because you know they make quite a bit of money. Um, so we thought, okay, well, we're a virtual museum, so we're going to digitally repatriate these objects. And so um, we have completed the repatriation of the 800 objects. <laughs> but what we also noticed is that although they had all these objects, um, sometimes they didn't know what those objects were. And sometimes a set of objects which, which belonged together was scattered all over the museum without the knowledge that these things don't make sense apart. So one of the things that we did, that we have done with the um, digital repatriation platform that we have built is to make it so that the owners of the objects can also contribute to the metadata of the objects. How did we do that? We took objects for which we could identify um, the area they were taken from over 100 years ago. And we took those objects digitally and took them back to six villages in the Gwembe Valley and asked the people whether they remembered those objects because taking objects out of Africa meant we've disconnected to those objects oftentimes. And we wanted to know whether these people would actually reconnect to those objects and what kind of information they'd have about those objects. And what happened was people, for the most part, connected back to those objects. And what came out of that is that we realized that you know, objects in a, in, a, in, a, in a Western museum sometimes are just like a pot, and it says a pot. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. But when we took the objects back to the villages, what we heard, what we learned, what we saw is that some of the, you know, the objects that had been a pot in Sweden also had poetry attached to it. It had songs attached to it. It had meditative practices attached to it. There was so much more to each object than you could find in the Swedish Museum. But our thing was also to say, so how do we collect all this information and put it for anybody who wants to access these objects to learn much more about the object than they would learn in Sweden? So when we went to the villages, we did the research on who was connected to the phone, who could read and write, who could, because we really wanted the owners of the objects to be able to contribute. We want the owners of the objects to be able to produce knowledge about objects as well. So we did all that, and the, and the villagers themselves came up with very creative ways of how they would contribute to that data, how they would check and reference their own information. That led to a, a completely new way of, um, a new model of provenance, which I think would work very well in Africa, because when you talk about provenance in Western museums, you're talking about the usual things like receipts and books, and, but that was now something completely different. And working with the villagers, we had actually come up with a new way of um, provenance for objects, for African objects that might not have anything written about them. Um, when we presented that, we were invited by Yale Museum um, to actually present our new method of provenance, because it was something that was completely new. And we've been invited again um, in November to go and present again on African provenance now. So we've kind of contributed to a new system of provenance which is based on African methodology. So our aim to center communities in knowledge production is something that I think has, has worked really well. And we, now that we have completed repatriating digitally the 800 objects, we will go to even more communities and see, and see how they connect to more objects so we can get more information. Our platform, we call it from village to university because we want from the village to the university to, to be able to contribute information about objects and to be able to exchange information about objects. Oftentimes, the owners of the objects are left out of the equation, and we want to include them in that equation. They are also knowledge producers. Um, then, um, 
so there are so many other things that, are, that have happened, but I'll tell you one of the other things that we do as a museum is we, we um, take groups of women into the game park um, for workshops um, because there, there are aspects of, of, of uh, documenting our history, like photography, for example, that we need to, you know, to, to kind of pump up in terms of um, turning their gaze to the fact that you know, you're documenting history when you're taking photographs. So we've had uh, women in photography as, as the Women's History Museum. We did a hum women in photography workshop in the game park. We did uh, women tra writers, travel writers, because travel writing is also a very uh, important way of actually documenting current, current history. Um, we've also taken women into the game park to, to um, we discovered while we were there one time that there was a site that must have been a, a trading site um, in the valley, um, maybe two or three hundred years ago. And we found some human bones, we found you know, bracelets and necklaces. So it must have been a, a trading place. And so the last uh, workshop that we had, we actually took women archaeologists, women historians, women in heritage, and women museologists to that place. And we spent the time just excavating that area, and we came back with, you know, the, uh, this, they've just finished writing the reports on the site. But for us, it's a way of getting women involved in history, in museology, documenting history, and going out there and publishing about what, what it is that they're doing, what they're discovering. So those workshops have also been really, um, I think, successful because we really want women to, to be at the forefront of uh, documenting our history. Um, some of the other things that have happened, for example, is um, we, we were identified and we got into an agreement with Google Culture. Google Culture is the part of Google that actually deals with museums. So Google Culture gave us, they've given us a space and we got some young people like yourselves to build a virtual museum on that space. Yeah. And that was very interesting. Right now they're working, um, they're making avatars of the women in the history. <laughs> and they're going to build a metaverse and populate it with our history and our character so that you can actually talk to the, to the, to the women. Yeah. <laughs> um, we also partnered with Google, Google PRX. Um, Google PRX basically, they just gave us the, the equipment to, to make our animation and um, any audio that we want to make um, in terms of content. Um, I said a little bit about how um, Af I think the big thing about Africa, Africa and objects being in, in, in the West is that um, you know, the, the, there's money made from African objects in museums, but we never see it. So one of the things that uh, we're doing right now, um, a couple of months ago, um, I was selected out of about 270 people globally to be a fellow of the Next One Billion team. This is a, a fellow, it's a fellowship that is created by Ethereum, the cryptocurrency. And so Ethereum selects like five people from around the world. If you have a project, you, you, you um, pitch it. And my project was, was selected. And what I'm doing right now is, again, with young people, because you know, I like to work with young people, because then I know there's longevity <laughs> in what I'm doing. Because <laughs> if I do it with young people, it will last. You know? If I do it alone, I've got like 20 more years to go or something. I don't know. <laughs> so um, what that project is about is now um, we took the objects back digitally. Can we also now economically repat you know, um, repatriate those? Things? So what we're creating, um, what we're creating now with the young people, is an income sharing platform. So that if somebody sees an object in the Swedish Museum, for example, if they pay to see the object, that payment, we have created a platform where that payment 
Uh, we will open a wallet for the Swedish Museum and for the Zambian Museum on this side. That payment will immediately be divided between the museum on this side and that side. <laughs> Using crypto or, or fiat if you want, but mostly crypto because it's, it's easy to, to, to do it that way because we're doing it uh, on the blockchain. Um, the other thing that we are putting on the blockchain as well is the, the, um, the, the objects. Remember I said we discovered that the object has so much more to them. So we're putting them on the blockchain as well because on the blockchain we can put the music, we can put the poetry, we can put everything. Yeah? And it, it will stay and it will be stable there. So we're, we're moving all that stuff onto the blockchain. Um, so that's the income sharing platform that we, that we hope to, to launch soon. Um, the young people who I'm working with just came back from Nigeria two days ago where they had gone to, to share the idea with some other young people there. Um, so another thing that is happening um, because of all these things that I've told you about is that um, UNESCO, um, the United Nations Wing for Science and Education, have now asked um, the Women's History Museum to do everything I've described, the Wikipedia, the podcasts, everything, to now spread that across the Southern African region. Because um, there's so much history that has to be gathered, but there's so much history that people must also start learning about the Southern African region, especially women who were involved in the liberation struggle. So that's that whole project is around gathering information around women who were in the liberation struggle. And some of them still alive, some of them not. But we will be um, training young people to make content, to use AI, to use the blockchain, to use all those things so that they can start spreading that, having more ways of spreading our, our history than just one way. So. <laughs> So that's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit uh, of some of the things we're doing. Um, and I think, have I run over? Or am I still? Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's uh, some of the things that we're doing. Um, but it's been extremely um, interesting because we've learned at every point um, many new things. But I think our, our drive is we're not going to do this the way everybody does it because otherwise we're not contributing anything new to humanity. Um, um, I, think, um, I think it was the ambassador who said this, but I say my, my father taught me two things. He told me, you didn't come here to learn one thing. You came here to learn many things and learn them and learn them well. And so that's basically what I do every day. And the other thing was, if not you, then who? Yeah? If there's anything going on that you feel should change, if not you, then who? Yeah? So I'll stop there because I'm hoping that I'll get more questions from you. Um, you might want to learn a little bit more about some of the stuff I've talked about. And, and while I'm talking, I'm sure some other stuff will come. So thank you very much. Is mine on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is it working now? Yes. Aha, it has to be on. Okay. 
Great. Um, thank you so much, Bamalinga, for sharing that with us. Um, I just have a few questions to get um, the conversation started, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, let me start with this one. Um, so you were telling us about the African or the Women's History Museum in Zambia and its mission and all the activities you've done. Could you elaborate a bit more on the ways that African indigenous knowledge is vital to life in the 21st century? Why is it important what you're doing? I think, um, one, I think because um, African indigenous knowledge hasn't been well articulated from our perspective, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, I think there's a huge chunk missing that could actually benefit humanity. I think every human culture has something to contribute to our common narrative. And so some of the things um, about our indigenous knowledge, for example, as Zambian cultures, um, a, few, a few, last week we were, um, I was giving a talk about um, our indigenous astronomy, Chokwe astronomy, um, which adds quite a bit more to what is, you know, normally when you hear astronomy, it's Greek, yeah? <laughs> but there is African astronomy, and it has its own very interesting aspects um, and how it connects to humanity, to human beings and their, their connection to the stars, how people look at the stars in terms of their own life um, and where they'll go when they die. Um, and it's interesting because for the Chokwe, for example, the, 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 the star system where they say, you go when you die, is actually one of the star systems that actually creates new stars. Yeah, so, you know, they're, they're just things like that. But also, um, for example, the book that I'm writing now is about, is about traditional marriage. It's a traditional marriage um, ceremony that we do. But the way I've, I'm writing it, I'm pointing out the, 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 the science and the neurobiology behind our rituals. Because when, we, when I read an anthropological book, it's just kind of like they're just describing the, the surface, but underneath, um, there is so much more. There's so much more. Um, when I was writing that book, I kind of took apart the whole ritual, the whole ceremony. I analyzed why did they use red, white, and black only, the ceremony. What, why um, did we use this circumference of a hat what does sound and space have to do with what? With teaching. Why did they, um, you know, there are certain things that you have to do when you're making your marriage vows. For us, the marriage vow is not just uh, until death us do part. <laughs> it's, um, you have to act it, you have to feel it. You have to feel what you're going to experience in your marriage. So for example, there's, um, uh, there's one, one um, embusa, which embusa is just a, it's a clay, it's a clay uh, figure or a clay structure. This clay structure called Akankonkwa is actually um, just a big circle like this, but it's got random little holes everywhere. And the two people who are getting married have to stand opposite each other and hold hands across this thing, um, this embusa. That is teaching you that you're now entering a partnership and you will have to hold each other. What they tell you is that you have to make a full circle around this thing without breaking it, because marriage is very delicate. Huh? It's very well decorated with beans and things and you mustn't knock those beans off that thing. So in marriage, you have to really, really be discerning. You have to be careful. You, have, you can break something very easily, yeah? I can see all the married people nodding. <laughs> but what also happens when you, start, when you start doing that exercise, what happens is that you suddenly start feeling the whole, all the emotions that you feel when you're in a relationship. Because suddenly you have to, you have to compromise you, you get angry, you know, you stop and you can't move anymore and then you realize, oh, if you don't move anymore, then, you know, everybody's singing and clapping and saying, go, 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 you know. So you, you have to work it out. So you, you, you are forced to work things out 
but they tell you you can't speak to each other. That's another lesson to tell you that marriage is not about just words. You have to find other ways to communicate with each other. By the time you finish this exercise, you have compromised, you have led, you have been compassionate, you have been empathetic, you, you've, you've, you've gone through the whole gamut of emotions. You've blamed, you've been angry, you've wanted to you know, <laughs> punch the other person in the nose. You, everything happens, but once you get to the end, it is so empowering because you have done it, yeah? And it's something that sticks in your memory. But I also analyze what, hap what is happening, what neurotransmitters are, are being secreted in your body when you hold hands, when you're angry. When you're, so because all those things are, are forced, you, you just go through them as you go. And for me, that kind of knowledge, um, I, have, I actually wrote a paper about the pedagogy of, of Mbusa, but that kind of knowledge is important uh, even in the modern world for, for marriage counseling, for relationship counseling, for, you know, for so many things that if we don't put that out for other people to learn about our knowledge and how we taught, we taught through the senses. And so there's six for us. <laughs> in the West, you hear about five. We talk about 13. <laughs> Um, and so through all those 13 senses, we teach and it stays in the body. And you remember, because I remember when I went through that, I, I remember even the first song that was sung. It's, it's a very physical learning. It's, it's real body learning. And for me, that's important to share. You know, why wouldn't that be valuable to another culture? Why wouldn't that be valuable to you? So for me, indigenous knowledge and exploring it and actually also putting the the modern explanations to it has become very, very important because I think that way our cultures will also help each other and we'll, we'll be able to understand through each other's cultures much more than through our own and only our own. Thank you. Great, thank you. So my next question is to help the young people in the room. Um, I know many of our students here at Georgia State University, they're sent here by their parents and they're they're told to get a degree in something that will get you a job. Mm. <laughs> um, they don't want to hear about anything except medicine, law, business, uh, maybe sciences, mm. something that will get you a job. Um, so you majored in sociology. Um, I know when I told my parents I was majoring in French, mm. it broke their hearts. <laughs> and they said, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> Um, so could you share with the young people here about um, how you got from your sociology degree to mm -hmm. where you are now? How did you build a career? Mm -hmm. How did you get your first job? Those kinds of things. Because I, I think the young people here need to know what to tell their parents <laughs> to defend their choices if they <laughs> go off what their parents wish. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So yeah, so I also had to sit, had that discussion with my parents. And um, I was the artsy child, you know. Um, if, if, if you were a Bemba, you'd have understood immediately when she introduced me that I'm a twin. And my twin sister is the, she's left brain, mathematics, you know, <laughs> and I was the dreamy, floaty one. <laughs> um, so I wasn't, you know, I was kind of like, yeah, I'm going to draw and, you know, make money. And I think I was lucky because my father is also an artist. He's a writer. He was, was. A writer, so I think he kind of like understood where I was coming from, but we still had that chat because it was like, so how are you going to make a living? You know, okay, I'm an artist, so I know that it's not easy. How are you going to make a living? You have to get a degree. So, yeah, okay. So, I understand from a parent's perspective that they really want you to have a safe place to land if your dream doesn't come true or whatever. Just have that thing in your back pocket so that. When you go out there and you really do what you want to do, which you can, um, if anything goes wrong, you can still wave your degree and say, I've got this, and you can get to wherever you want to go. So that was the deal with my dad. I had to go to university. And I went to university. I did my degree. My minor was uh, in psychology. And when I finished school, um, again, everybody's saying, well, so when are you getting a job? <laughs> So, so I, I got into a job in a, in, a, in a mining conglomerate. 
And I always say to people that I was there for like eight minutes. But, <laughs> uh, but no, really, I was there for eight years. But I think I just, I really just needed, I wanted to learn. Um, it was a very good training ground, that particular company, because there were, there were a lot of very, very good systems. You know, it, it was a very good training ground for me because I knew, you know, the first day I walked into, and it was a very nice office, you know, very nice everything. I stood there and I thought, wow, am I supposed to be here eight hours a day? <laughs> Five times a week? And then the whole world is going on outside? You know, like, oh, that, it just didn't make sense to me. Like, how do people do this, you know? <laughs> so I kind of stuck around for eight years, learned all the ropes. Um, um, it, it, as I said, it was a very good training ground. But my whole thing was, I'm getting out of here, and then I can stand on my own two feet and, and do my own thing. So when I left, um, I set up my own consultancy company. And because I'd learned uh, a lot of the HR side, the human resource side, I set up my own HR company, and we started kind of you know, doing that stuff. But also, because of the art side, um, I got very involved. Uh, when I left, that was just the, the beginning of the whole HIV AIDS pandemic. So I got very involved in the communication side because that I could do. And, and I built uh, quite a big CV in terms of, um, of that, communicating, making training videos and stuff like that for the armed forces, for um, you know, uh, different, different um, demographics, because the pandemic kind of showed itself differently in different um, demographics. So we made different videos for di like the soldiers, it was different for them. The medical people, it was different. It was showing in different ways. Um, then you had like commercial sex workers and you know, so we had to like do all that stuff. Um, and so I did that and learned a lot because again, as I said, for me, I felt that if I stayed in that one job, I'd only just learn that thing. Um, being a consultant meant I could work in a lot of industries. I think you heard Jenny say I've worked in the, you know, um, hospitality, in government, in whatever. So I did all that. It has helped me a lot because I, I, I'm able to join dots uh, when I see a problem because I know this industry, I know that industry, I know this industry. I've been there. And so, yeah, so I kind of like started from there. But, you know, the, the, the thing I said about if you're going to learn something, learn it well and do it well, that served me uh, very well because then people start noticing you and start hiring you and start coming to you for, for advice. You know, you become a go-to, you know, make yourself a go-to person <laughs> so that people know that, if, oh, I need this, let me go to. Yeah, so I kind of did that. So eventually, um, I, I really did make a, a career out of being a, a consultant and um, from there, I can say that you know I ended up being on the board for UNESCO. I was on the board for ZNBC, for the Zambia Broadcasting Corporation. At one time, I was on the board for for a Zambian company, a Chinese company, <laughs> and like a British company, which was absolutely marvelous. It was absolutely wonderful for me because those three cultures operated so differently. You know, even the board meetings were completely different. Um, the strategies were completely different. Um, even though you'd give them the same target, it was interesting for me to see how the Chinese approached the pro a problem, how the Zambians approached the problem, and how the, the Western company approached the problem. Extremely, it was a real learning uh, for me. But I, I was also, I chaired like the Atiro Network of Africa, which is about 6,000 artists from Cape to Cairo. Um, I was the first chair, and uh, they voted me back. Um, so, for me, I think it's um, knowing what, knowing what, one, what you enjoy doing. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing that gives you um, satisfaction when you do it, being good at that thing, um, and doing that thing. If what your parents tell you is what you actually also want, then that's even a plus. But I think all parents want is that you have something stable to, to uh, spring back, to spring back on, if things get tough, especially if you want to be a, an artist like me. <laughs> you really, it's it's not it's not uh, it's not easy, but uh, I wouldn't swap it for anything else.
Great. Uh, I, I'm going to ask one more question, but while I do, I want to encourage audience members who have questions. We have a microphone on each side. If you want to line up, um, we'll go between them to get a couple of questions from the audience. So while I ask and she answers, feel free to move uh, if you have a question. So um, what's one lesson your career has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in their lives? Mm. I think I think I'll, I'll just probably just repeat myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, whatever it is that you choose to do, um, just do it. Do it to the best of your ability. For me, what also helps is 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 why am I doing it? Yeah. Um, always ask yourself why you're doing something. And if it's uh, if it's something that gives you purpose, it gives you direction. It's even better. But ask yourself why you're doing something, because then you will understand why you're doing something, and it's much better when you understand what it is that you want to do, especially when you're a young person. Believe me, even the older ones don't know why they're doing things sometimes. But, <laughs> but it's nice to know why you're doing something. And if you find that purpose, it makes so much more meaning over anything that you choose to do. Great. Thank you. So we'll start over here. Hello there. My name Hi. is Aleta Muzorewa, and I'm from Zimbabwe. Ah. And thank you for mentioning the work that you're going to be doing in Southern Africa there, because we all need to work together. Mm -hmm. uh, and welcome. I have lived in the United States for 40 years this year. And when you spoke about the monetization of our pieces in Europe, is there no legal recourse that we can actually take for those that have time and the talent to go after that income? Because I understand the process you're doing right now is to get the work done. Mm -hmm. Is there someone else that can take that and sue? <laughs> <laughs> sue. <laughs> sue for that money to just use the, the direct uh, word for it? Mm. It's, a, it's, very, it's a very complex road uh, to sue. I mean, even if, say, Zambia wanted to sue, there are so many pieces in so many museums <laughs> around Europe, you wouldn't even kind of like know where to start. But the other thing is that each of those European countries also have their own rules about those objects. And it's, it's, a, it's just a tangled, tangled web. What we're finding now, of course, Africans are now speaking out and some objects are coming back to Africa. But what we're also seeing in, in, in our space is that the European museums are insisting that they choose the objects that they bring back. So whether the, those objects are the ones you want or not, they want to insist that they choose the objects because they know which objects <laughs> they want to keep and which have more value. Yeah. So the, the, that, that whole discussion is actually ongoing. And uh, France is kind of leading, leading it on the European side. And then um, Benin is leading it on the African side. But all those things are being explored. But I think what is daunting is just the, the, the thickets that that whole scenario presents in terms of just saying, okay, we will sue. So if, if Germany then is sued and they lose the case and they have to whatever, then Sweden will think, oh no, then they will change their law so that they, it's, it's very complex. So ours is kind of a sneaky way of doing it. <laughs> but, but I think it's, it's, it's a way that can actually work much easier because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get caught up in the protocols. Yeah. So we'll go to this microphone now. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Mm. Um, we're from Stone, we're from Freedom Middle School in Stone Mountain, and um, we're in from, and so we're from the Free Boss Robotics team, and so my question is, you're an artist yourself, and the question is like, how do you think art can impact the world, and or or maybe even change it, or in well and how we look at it? Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I think art. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think art has impacted the world from, from the get-go, you know, from, from whenever. Um, if you come to my country, I will take you from the top of the country to the bottom of the country, and you look at uh, rock art, for example, because art was one way that people documented, expressed, did whatever. Art is, um, you can't divorce human life from art. 
Yeah? There is no human life without art. And even the remotest cultures have art because it is, it is part of our essence to express ourselves and to reimagine things and to create things. It's just how we are made as human beings. And if you think about it, almost everything here is because of an artist. Yeah, Any, anything that you look at here, you know, that exit sign was written, had to be, <laughs> had to be crafted by an artist, everything. We, we once, um, you know, we were writing a script for a play, a day without art, and you know, it basically starts with a person waking up who normally switches on the music, and the music is gone because the art is gone. Um, they can't dress because the, you know, their clothing is all designed by art. You know, so every aspect of human life has some art in it, and, and art has always impacted human life because it is the way we express ourselves. You know, um, it is the way countries, if we don't know what America is, when we see the flag, we're like, oh, there's America. But that's a piece of art, the flag, yeah? So art has impacted human, human life. It is part of human life. And without it, I think human life would be completely empty and without meaning or meaning couldn't be carried from you to me without art. Is that, does that? <laughs> Thank you. We'll go, we'll go to this microphone now. Hello, Grandma. Hi. Yeah, for, everyone, <laughs> for everyone, my name is Makumbi Muleba. I'm from Zambia. This is my eighth year of being in Atlanta. And yeah, my question for you is, how, how do you see policymakers as well as institutions support such uh, initiatives as the ones that you're running? And, and what lessons have you learned from some of your engagement with them? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that is really my grandchild. <laughs> Don't mind the gray beard. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I've, I've, I've also been very involved in policy, on the policy side, uh, because I realized that um, a lot of the things in my country, at least, um, cannot start, cannot move without some policy. Pol policy formulation, policy direction, uh, policy reviews. Um, so. Um, when I chaired the, the National Arts Council of Zambia, one of the things that I really pushed was to, 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 to create policy that would create an enabling environment for the, the sector. Um, not only policy, but also legislation, because those two things move together. So, um, okay, so in Zambia it's a little bit difficult because like the, this whole sector is scattered across eight ministries. <laughs> So you have to go, you know, for, for, for literature, you go to the Ministry of Education, for uh, film, you go to the Ministry of, you know, it's all over the place. But as long as you learn where they are, you follow them. And uh, so um, sometimes, uh, for example, we just applied as the National Arts Council, say to UNESCO, to say, can we, can we write a policy, uh, the national book policy or the national film policy or the national, we've created all those, we wrote them. Um, but it's, it's something that you have to engage the bureaucrats, you engage the minister, you engage parliament. There was one time when we were trying to get, um, we were trying to get some uh, rebates <laughs> on musical equipment and so forth, and I got all the artists to go to, parliament is like Congress, so I got all the artists to go and sit in the gallery, and because they're artists, everybody knows them, you know, the musicians and so forth, so every time the parliamentarians looked up, they saw these people who, oh, you know, and the bill for that day was, was that uh, particular bill about passing the rebates on the equipment. So every time they looked up, they saw an artist, and that bill passed without debate. <laughs> uh, so there, there are some strategies that we were using just to you know, get things done. But um, I think what is important, when I was at um, the Atero Network, when I was sharing the Atero Network, the other thing that we, we really did was to train artists those who are interested, because you know artists are artists, but those who are interested in policy, um, in, in looking at all the conventions that African countries have signed uh, with the United Nations or with the AU or with the Nairobi you know, Plan of Action, um, how we engage that, and we, we, we created a movement to, for these people to go back and engage their governments. But you have to be knowledgeable. You have to be knowledgeable about your own country. You have to be knowledgeable about the sector so that you can engage um, in an informed way with your policymakers. I think that's the important thing. Great, thank you. And 
<laughs> the one thing, the one finite resource in the universe is time. You can make more money. You cannot make more time, unless anyone in here has invented a time machine. And that being said, um, we're running out of time. So we're going to take one more question from the microphone, and then we're going to invite Matthew Tembo to come up to play some more music while we exit. And then the remaining questions you can ask uh, more informally outside. And before we adjourn, I just wanted to let everyone in the audience know who's not from Georgia State. Um, we have several. Um, 1913 ambassadors here. They were the ones in the suits welcoming you. These um, are volunteers, students from our student body. Um, they apply to become ambassadors. It's a great honor to have them here. And so during the reception, I encourage you, if you're, if you're visiting Georgia State, these are great people to talk to to learn more about the university. So we'll take one more question. Thank you. Good evening. I am a member of the Freedom Middle School robotics team, and my question is, how does art help people understand others' culture? Sorry? How my question art? is, how does art help people understand other cultures? Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, I think, I think uh, you know, when, when I was growing up, my father used to drug me to... <laughs> to all sorts of cultural events. So I watched uh, Russian ballet, you know, classic Indian dance, um, you know, with my father, because he, he also felt it was important to experience other cultures, apart from my own. Um, but when you experience another culture, and um, I always say this to people, if you ever have an opportunity to, to be in another culture, to be immersed in another culture, it's a privilege, uh, because it gives you so much more, um, I think, uh, vision in terms of seeing life and seeing things. And I think sometimes we communicate much better just through the arts. You know, without a word being said, I can be touched by what you do, even though you're from Japan or wherever. But your art will touch me. I think I have seen that even, even countries that don't get on can host each other when it comes to the arts. Yeah, because art is a universal, a universal thing. It's a, we we all have it. We recognize it when we see it. We all feel it. It doesn't matter what you know. There's there's pieces of music I sing. I don't even know what they mean. They're from Congo or somewhere or French or Spanish, but it's music, and and I appreciate that and I love it even if it's not my culture or from my culture. So because culture is 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 um. Everybody has, there's a culture everywhere. And, and we're, you know, what are, what are um, kind of like universals, you know, that exists in every culture. You know, we all dance, we all sing, we all have poetry, we all have religion or some divine, you know, connection to something, whether it's a tree or the sky or the stars. Those things might look different, but ultimately we are all the same. And that's why we connect um, so quickly through the arts. And so for me, I've seen the arts do much better than all that official stuff at the United Nations about <laughs> conflict and whatever. All you do is bring an artist in front of people and people are nodding and shaking each other's hands and you know, feeling much better about each other and themselves. So for me, I think one of the best, the best weapons for humankind is to share art. Thank you. And now we'll turn it over to Matthew Tembo for some more music. Um, and feel free um, to exit through the doors. The reception's outside in the lobby. And um, there's a sign for the restrooms if you're seeking those. So thank you so much for being here.